Tibet, 1923. The nation has been dominated by Buddhism for nearly 400 years. Its economy is based upon the nomadic herding of sheep, yaks, and goats, and the cultivation of barley and millet. Post offices are little more than ramshackle huts, and mail is delivered by runners who work in relays of four miles each. The nation's capital, Lhasa, is a city without electricity or wheeled vehicles. In rural areas, hermits live in caves for years at a time, and nomads prop their rifles up with antelope horns. Monks survive sub-zero temperatures through mental discipline. As Chinese soldiers maneuver through the Tibetan countryside, peasant women throw dust at them, a local custom for expelling devils. In a land dominated by monasteries so large, they seem more like medieval cities than religious communities, Tibetans are living in a world with no free press, where illnesses are attributed to evil spirits, and where a feudal theocracy of some 200,000 monks wields power with an iron fist. By the mid-1920s, a telegraph line is linked from India to the Tibetan city of Gyanse, and an English school is built. Most Tibetans have little fondness for foreign visitors. Outside travelers are either reported to local officials as intruders, or in more extreme cases, relieved of their possessions and sent along their way. Western adventurers, determined to visit Tibet by way of the rugged Himalayas, sometimes pose as pilgrims, blackening their faces with walnut juice and iodine to escape detection. Snowstorms, roving bandits, and temperatures as low as 40 below zero claim the lives of many. Most are forced to cut their losses and turn back. By the mid-1940s, the number of Westerners to have reached Lhasa had increased, and the nation saw its first automobiles. Roads were paved, and Western books and magazines appeared. By mid-century, few doubted that Tibet was in need of modernization. Political and social reform were long overdue. Most Tibetans would have preferred that these changes be made internally, yet a dramatic turn of events was waiting on the horizon. In the spring of 1950, Chinese troops began mobilizing along the Tibetan border. The devastating attack that was about to occur would change Tibet forever. The Sera Monastery, high on a hill overlooking Lhasa, Each afternoon, at 3.30, a large group of monks engages in a lively debate. One topic of discussion usually lasts two weeks before being replaced by another. Subject matter ranges from philosophy to Buddhism, from medicine to math. The proceedings have a militaristic feeling about them as the monks capture each other's attention with the whip-like clapping of hands. <laughs> Tibet's monasteries were once the linchpin of an entire society. In years past, Monks were highly influential in government affairs and wielded economic power as well. But the earth-shattering events that rocked Tibet in the 1950s and 60s reduced the country's monasteries to rubble. At the spectacular site of Ganden, 30 miles outside of Lhasa, some 2,000 monks saw their numbers drop to only a few hundred. At nearby Drepong, 10,000 were reduced to 600. 
The lofty Talung Monastery saw 7,000 monks dwindle to only 45. Nunneries, too, were attacked. Sarah saw its colleges destroyed. The Tibet of today is a land of ragged nomads, breathtaking mountains, and dedicated pilgrims who think nothing of trudging through the snow to reach holy shrines and monasteries. Its cities are undergoing startling change, mostly due to technology and Chinese migration. Tibetan culture now hangs in the balance, clinging desperately to tradition on the one hand, while giving way to a world of blue jeans, recreational vehicles, and yak enchiladas on the other. The nation has changed more in the last 60 years than in the previous 600. Few nations on earth have inspired so many, from adventurers to theologists, from authors to heads of state. Tibet is an imposing country. Its high altitude, wide open spaces, and often meager food supply are not for the timid. Still, Tibet is a magical place. Its culture, topography, and people are as unique as anywhere on Earth. In short, there's probably no other place quite like Tibet, the roof of the world. With a southern border straddled by four of the world's five highest mountains, each over 26,000 feet, Tibet stretches for 2,000 miles along the northern frontier of India. The Himalayan mountains form a natural border with India to the south. The name Himalaya is derived from the ancient Sanskrit words Hima and Alaya, 
meaning abode of snow. A 1,500 mile mountain range arising out of the tropical rainforest above Burma, the mountains run westward through Bhutan, Sikkim, Tibet, Nepal, and Pakistan. Tibet's high plateau influences global jet streams and the Indian monsoon. The nation's radio reception has been called the greatest on Earth. <laughs> Tibetans originate neither from China nor India, but from nomadic tribes racially similar to the Mongols. The notion that Tibet has long been a nation of peace is unfounded. Early Tibet was an amalgam of competing chieftains and their respective clans in continual conflict with one another. By the year 750, the tribes had forged the greatest empire in Asia, spanning more than 2,000 miles. In the year 763, Tibet attacked and occupied areas of western China. It later occupied parts of India, Nepal, and Central Asia. <laughs> Buddhism entered Tibet by way of India in the 8th century, 1,200 years after the Buddha's birth and long after it had reached China and other lands of the East. It united a tribal society, gradually replacing, but also fusing with, a primitive form of shamanism called Bong. For present-day travelers, Access to Tibet is primarily through Chengdu, China, and Kathmandu, Nepal. Chengdu, capital of Sichuan province, and brilliantly lit with neon after nightfall, is a city of 11 million people. Travel agents in Chengdu's budget hotels make arrangements for visiting Lhasa and beyond. In Kathmandu, capital of Nepal, one finds similar access. Round-trip voyages from Kathmandu to Lhasa typically last seven days. Four of the seven days consist of road travel on the bone-crunching Friendship Highway. Tibet's points of interest are many and wide-ranging. To the north of Lhasa, Lake Nam So has become a magnet for Tibetan pilgrims who treat the lake and its surrounding hills as a holy shrine. In south-central Tibet, the base camp of Mount Chomolongma, better known as Mount Everest, is as close as most mortals will get to the icy peaks of the world's tallest mountain. Zhangmu, at an altitude of just under 4,000 feet, is viewed by some as a cross-cultural honky-tonk. But the restful green mountains that straddle Nepal and Tibet are an ideal place to recover from the high altitude of Tibet's enormous plateau. And Lhasa itself, one of the world's highest capital cities, one which reveals the stark contrasts of a nation where people pass their time at an average altitude of three miles above sea level. <laughs> Tibet's second largest city, Shigatse, feels like Butte, Montana, 1928. A 
great town for monks and farm tractors, Shigatse might be the tractor capital of the world. Its wide boulevards, carrying surprisingly little automobile traffic, Shigatse has an exceptional array of goods, services, lively storefronts, and outdoor markets. As prosaic and unexciting as it might feel to some, Shigatse does provide an introduction to the touchstones of Tibetan life. From the nomads to the pool shooting, from the monasteries hugging the clouds like natural amphitheaters, to the holy pilgrims that flock to these monasteries, circling endlessly in a clockwise direction, storing up merit for the next lifetime and beyond. In the Chinese part of town, jewelry and electronic items have become symbols of a Tibetan culture that is changing so fast that its cities may soon be little different from Shanghai or Hong Kong. The Tibetan part of Shigatse is more than holding its own. Age-old customs and traditions still hold sway along narrow side streets leading from the fort to the monastery. In such areas, time, at least for the moment, hangs suspended. In the streets of Shigatse, as in many parts of Tibet, one is constantly confronted by a phalanx of sidewalk butchers. For a country with such a reverence for animals, the experience is an odd one. What do they do here in Tibet, remarks an Austrian visitor. Go out for a walk with a yak and then push him off a cliff? One Tibetan explanation is that it's actually Islamic butchers that have prepared the meat. The explanation might be a plausible one, but still, one wonders. The proliferation of steakhouses, yak burgers, and momo snacks surely is in need of some explanation. Recently, the lunch special at a Chinese restaurant in Lhasa almost seemed to be taking the phenomenon and rubbing it in. Their featured lunch dish was cold sliced yak tongue. While Shigatse may be Tibet's second largest city, its underpinnings are clearly rural. Tibet is, after all, still largely an agrarian society revolving around the cultivation of barley and annual agricultural cycles. The distances from place to place may be enormous, but Tibetans have shown themselves to be masters of adversity. They have tailored their culture to be in perfect harmony with their environment. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Tibet is changing. Even in some of the more remote Tibetan villages, obligatory racing stripes and Western-style day packs now adorn the backs of school children. But the full force of mass tourism, fortunately, has yet to take its toll. Villagers seem genuinely enthused with foreign visitors. <laughs> there could be an Einstein living in one of these villages, an Israeli visitor remarks, but we wouldn't know it, would we? He would be spending his whole life looking after sheep. Chapa Puti, known as Puti for short, is only 20. She works seasonally as a waitress at the Yak Hotel in Lhasa, brushing up on her English and serving meals to a flock of international backpackers. And what are you studying? English? Only English. Only English, huh? Yes. Do you feel you're getting better? <laughs> Improving? Yes. Yes. No. Um, what about other countries? Are there any other countries you'd like to live in? No, I don't care. You'd rather live in Tibet, yes. yes. And um, how, about, um, how about China and Tibet? You have Chinese people living here and Tibetans. Do they communicate with each other? Or is it difficult? They have two different languages, right? Yes, it's different. Is that difficult? Yes, it's too difficult. Difficult. Do you know Chinese people and you can't talk to them? I can a little. You can talk a little? Yes. You speak a little Chinese? Yes. And do they speak Tibetan? No. No? Huh. For some people speak Tibetan. Speak Tibetan. Do they speak English? English and Tibetan. Yeah. You speak English and Tibetan, but do they speak uh, English too or not? Your friends? Yes. They yes, they huh? speak English. Oh, yeah. I think we have very little contact uh, between the Chinese and the Tibetans. It's mainly uh, because of the difference, you know, racially, uh, linguistically, and also uh, culturally. Many of the Chinese are beginning to understand uh, the Tibetan culture. Uh, this is mainly because of the interest shown by the people in the West. This restaurant, there are people from many different countries, right, that come yes. here? Wh which countries? Um, Holland and... <laughs> Holland? Yes, and America. America? Um, and Japanese. Japanese. Uh, many others, right? Yes. Chinese and... Chinese and Tibetan. Uh -huh. So, does that make you learn about other cultures? You learn more about people? <laughs> you don't know? Because um, usually when people come in from different cultures, you feel like you learn something, that one group is dif different from the other, they behave differently, or they, their customs are different. Yes. At the end of October, the Dutch owners of the restaurant where she works held a Halloween party. Puti waited on tables until 5 in the morning. <laughs> I enjoy it very much. Yeah. Lake Nam So, six hours outside of Lhasa, has become a major attraction for pilgrims from all parts of Tibet. 
40 miles in length and 20 miles wide, the turquoise lake is surrounded by rock formations straight out of Planet of the Apes. A stream of pilgrims circles the small holy mountain in a clockwise fashion, a walk of about two hours. The procession passes ancient rock paintings, prayer flags, and sacred cairns. Pilgrims can be seen rubbing holy rocks, swinging prayer wheels, and tossing white ceremonial scarves toward the mountaintop. Some lick sacred water off of cave walls. Others eat holy dirt. When the marchers cross a great divide, they toss small bits of paper inscribed with blessings into the air for good luck. The proceedings feel almost biblical. For a Tibetan Buddhist, storing up merit is not just something theoretical. The possibility of returning in the next life as a nobleman, as opposed to a peasant, for example, is something palpable. On one part of the journey, a crowd gathered round a small opening in the mountain. The crevasse was too small to permit entry by most Westerners. Entering into such a crevasse is believed to be a form of sin detection. Amazingly, three Tibetan men in succession crawled out of the mountain. They looked as natural as though they had just been invited to breakfast. It's a mystery how people in their 60s, 70s, and older can muster the strength for such grueling walks. It's true that the blood of Tibetans carries more hemoglobin, allowing for more oxygen to be extracted from the air. Still, it's also true the Lake Nam Se, at over 15,000 feet, leaves many younger people gasping for breath. The weather, too, can be a problem. Blizzards have been known to strike central Tibet in the middle of summer. In the lakeside village of Tashi Dor, nomads set up yak haired tents and burn yak dung fires for warmth and comfort. Many keep a home base for the winter then travel for the rest of the year in search of pasture, sometimes in groups of 20 families or more. Others pursue the salt trade, swapping bricks of salt for barley grain. Wolves are occasionally spotted in the area, and the dogs belonging to nomads often become quite agitated by the shiny wheels of bicycles.
As the holy procession is still in progress by sundown, the best guess is that the pilgrims will walk all night. The marchers couldn't be a more agreeable lot. They came to Lake Namso for good reasons. Very few will leave feeling disappointed. Tibet, with its high altitude, long distances, and sudden snowstorms, with its monks who read with no visible light. Tibet is a nation of cold hotel rooms and no centralized heat. Even cars and trucks in Tibet don't have heaters. What do they do here, an American woman asks? Buy a new car and then immediately detach the heating unit? Historically, Tibetans had no interest in Europe. They didn't climb mountains for pleasure. Their respect for all living things was so great that they would sometimes free the feet of ducks that were frozen to the ice. They would also break the ice on ponds and lakes to rescue freezing fish. Their very concept of time was different from other cultures. In the present day, Tibetans spontaneously break into song or laughter on buses or in the streets. Situations that in other countries would provoke tension, in Tibet, provoke little more than silver or gold-toothed grins. The effect is disarming. Yes, the country has its share of beggars, but for the most part, Tibet seems to be one of the few places on earth where people don't actually want anything from you. Much of the travel writing about Tibet is obsolete. Lhasa has 20,000 stray dogs that can range from being unpleasant to downright dangerous, travel writers explain. What's the best way to combat them, a Tibetan tour guide is asked. The tour guide laughs. The dogs are gone, he explains. <laughs> And what about all the small children who are supposed to be clamoring for Dalai Lama pictures? Hardly a single tourist reported having such an experience. Could it be that a younger generation of Tibetans is finding newer symbols to sustain itself? <laughs> Tibet is a country where monks are sometimes in need of singing lessons and where the English language can seem to be little more than an afterthought. The best way to make use of a Tibetan rickshaw driver is to hand him a slip of paper with the destination written on it in both Chinese and Tibetan. Otherwise, one might end up in Mongolia. As in many parts of West Africa, Tibetans are fond of physical embraces. The gestures are symbolic, not of romantic attachment, but of friendship and deep personal admiration. They have a heartwarming effect. Travelers to Tibet 
have their own share of worries. The prospects of car trouble in the Himalayas are normally too disturbing to even bother thinking about. Nobody knows anything about what happens to cars and buses that disappear along those roads, a Nepali restaurateur explains. The elevation is so high, the drop is so huge, usually the vehicles are never found. A German visitor concurs. This road's not such a bad one, he explains, about the dangerous dirt road which leads skyward to the Ganden Monastery. There are other roads in Tibet, he explains with a sly smirk, where one slip of the wheel and you've got a drop of 3,000 feet. An American woman tells a story about a broken axle on a car that was taking her to the remote area of Mount Kailash. We were horrified, she explained. We imagined ourselves sleeping in that car for weeks. Amazingly, the driver temporarily repaired the axle with metal and tape. It was later fixed for good by nomads. As in most places, it's the day-to-day -day conduct of ordinary individuals that defines a nation's character. Recently, two teenage girls in downtown Lhasa collided on their bicycles. They reacted in a manner that might seem strange in the West. Neither was angry. Both merely laughed. It's okay. Tibet's rapidly expanding capital, Lhasa, is a microcosm of Tibet's past and a keyhole into its future. With an elevation of just under 12,000 feet and no trees to speak of, Lhasa is located at the same latitude as New Orleans, Louisiana and Cairo, Egypt. Sections of the city are charming. Yet much of Lhasa is on the fast track to overdevelopment. In the late evening, ear splitting guitar solos rip through the piped in sound system of the city's mostly vacant downtown mall, just blocks away from the holiest temple in Tibet. International tourists, many of them Chinese, take snapshots of the Potala, a building the Chinese nearly destroyed a generation earlier. As lively as a medieval carnival, Lhasa's incomparable barcore circuit plays host to an almost endless entourage of devoted pilgrims. No place in Lhasa can rival the feeling of the four streets that surround the Jokhan. The mix of humanity could well fill a Hollywood epic. Hello. There's no such thing as boredom in Lhasa. One late afternoon stroll through the city's Tibetan quarter cures all ills. The area is also a shopper's paradise. Vendors lining the central route can be found selling everything from fur caps to fried potatoes, from holy scarves to handcuffs. Hello? 
The focal point of the activity is the Jokong itself, a visual tour de force. The temple is the most revered religious structure in all of Tibet. Originally built in the 7th century, the Jokan is a treasure trove of holy shrines, butter lamps and flickering candles. Its narrow passageways conceal some of Tibet's deepest mysteries. Pilgrims stream into the Jokan in single file slowly wending their way through the temple's corridors in a clockwise pattern. Many murmur and chant, their faces revealing a trance-like state of devotion. The ever-present aroma of butter tea fills the room. Buddhist monks make the rounds, some immersed in meditation, others checking for photo credentials, others still act as bouncers, giving a gentle shove or even a push to those who linger too long in the hallways. In one chapel, visitors try to hear the beating wings of a great mythological bird believed to live deep within the temple's walls. A city with origins in the 7th century, Lhasa's claim as Tibet's capital solidified in the 17th. The city once attracted traders and merchants from all parts of Central Asia. Monasteries drew monks from as far away as the Black Sea. But today, the story is a different one. Lhasa has an enormous city park which looks like it rolled off the pen of the designer of Tiananmen Square. The park is located across from a thoroughfare called East Beijing Road. The number of modern clothing stores alone in Lhasa is almost incomprehensible. Very good. A city with a mere 20 to 30,000 people at the time of the Chinese invasion has now exploded to well over 200,000. The population explosion has no end in sight. If the Jokang is at the top of each traveler's list, what then to make of the Potala, 13 stories high and filled with over a thousand chambers? Tibet's Potala is one of the most renowned buildings in all of Asia. Over a quarter of a mile long, the structure has been called everything from the Buddhist Vatican to one of the wonders of the world. Former New York Times writer Harrison Salisbury felt the Potala was dreadful, dark, evil and superstitious. His wife Charlotte called it the most fantastic, bizarre, and terrifying place I have ever seen. American architect Frank Lloyd Wright kept a picture of the Potala in his office. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> but the Potala area in Lhasa is a delight. Hawkers peddle their wares to strolling pilgrims who compete for space with camera-toting tourists. Out-of-tune street singers struggle to be heard over the cries of noodle vendors. And the lively proceedings are all played out to the backdrop of one of Asia's most spectacular buildings. The Patala has probably had a facelift or two since the Salisbury's paid their visit. Inside, electric lighting has been installed and the murals have been restored. The temple's repainted rooftop is just as beautiful as that of the Jokhan. Yes, the Potala has become a museum, and surely the admission fees are too high. The torture chambers are closed to the public, and interior photography is prohibited. Sadly, Tibetan pilgrims are only allowed to enter the Potala on specific days. But as a building that has survived all earthquakes, the Potala, the historic living quarters of the Dalai Lama, still stands. For Tibetans, the structure is a source of divine power. They may continue visiting this marvelous place for the next 300 years, just as they have visited over the last 300. While the sidewalks around the Potala preserve an authentic feeling of Tibetan culture, west of the Potala, for the next 20 blocks, the story changes. The expanse of Chinese shops and businesses, clothing stores, electronic shops and restaurants seems almost to be endless. The areas to the east of the Potala and the north as well aren't much different. In these areas, Lhasa might as well be Chengdu or Shanghai. Traditional Tibetan architecture, with its Hansel and Gretel type appeal, all too often finds itself facing the wrecking ball. The buildings replacing them are much less interesting. Time, unfortunately, is not on Lhasa's side. If present trends continue, the city may become little more than a huge shopping mall. Its two great tourist attractions, the Jokang and the Potala, serving as a magnet to attract tourists and international investors, but little else. The Chinese claim to have eliminated begging in Tibet. This would come as news to most residents of Lhasa. But Tibetan Buddhists have little quarrel with beggars. According to the tenets of Buddhism, the giving of alms allows one to store up merit, a nice insurance policy for the afterlife. One writer was quite taken by the idea. He felt it was the spiritual equivalent of collecting frequent flyer miles. Now, in 1949, China, you know, first invaded Tibet. And by 1951, they have completed the full occupation of Tibet. In 1949, a comet streaked across Tibetan skies. One year later, an earthquake struck. For a Tibetan population paying careful attention to omens, trouble lay ahead. The new Chinese government, under Mao Zedong, believed that Manchuria, Mongolia, Xinjiang, and Tibet were all Chinese provinces. They were determined to prove it. On October 7, 1950, China attacked Tibet from six different directions. 
40,000 Chinese troops encountered minimal resistance from a surprised Tibetan army. The outcome was decided in only 11 days. China imposed a settlement upon Tibet, and so began a long period of great unease. Curiously, only one member of the United Nations, El Salvador, condemned the Chinese invasion. As the years passed, China's desire to grow rice and wheat in Tibet led to disaster. By late 1961, 70,000 Tibetans had died of starvation. In 1959, many Tibetans had reason to believe that the Chinese were about to kidnap the Dalai Lama. In Lhasa, uprisings occurred. Consulting the state oracle, the Dalai Lama himself decided to flee to India disguised as a soldier. He arrived 14 days later. Thousands of his countrymen eventually joined him. In the weeks and months that followed, the Chinese quelled the uprising in Lhasa, in part by destroying nunneries and monasteries. Temples were looted, spiritual leaders and priests were executed, teachers, poets, writers, and artists were forced to confess their crimes, and children were paid a penny apiece to throw stones at them. Others were forced to watch executions and applaud. Many committed suicide. 100,000 Tibetans were placed into forced labor, some merely for the act of resisting. Years later, Tibetan nuns sometimes had their prison sentences extended for as long as six years for doing nothing more than singing songs in praise of the Dalai Lama. You know, China did one thing good, that after occupation, they built roads, you know, linking uh, north to south, east to west. But then most of these roads were built by Tibetans who were kept in forced labor camps in the 60s. And these people were not fed properly, and many, so many of them have died. So altogether, it is estimated that 1.2 million Tibetans have died as a direct result of Chinese occupation. And exactly uh, 6,256 uh, monasteries got completely destroyed. And some of these monasteries looked like small you know, towns, as you have seen. In Tibet today, some 2,000 monasteries have continued the process of rebuilding. Critics charge that Tibet's larger monasteries have become little more than tourist attractions. Many monks are felt to be informants for the Chinese government. But the monastic life lives on. Monasteries continue to offer services to small towns that in many cases were spawned by monasteries in the first place. The reconstruction of Tibet's monasteries has required a major effort. At the Ganden Monastery, one of Tibet's most spectacular, repair work has proceeded for decades. The work continues on a daily basis as the monastery complex has gradually been rebuilt stone by stone. Red paint for the monastery's face is mixed like a witch's brew in large vats. The heat from the process is a great antidote to Tibet's frigid early morning air. The paint is then carted to the top of the monastery and squirted down by fire hose. While Tibetan monasteries are sometimes refurbished by real craftsmen, 
This seems to be the exception more than the rule. The limestone finishes, too, are just poured down from the rooftops and buckets, a tourist explains. The detail work is left to the imagination. Hi. Tibet's monasteries are now faced with unexpected new pressures. A Middle Eastern tourist tells the following story. Two Buddhist nuns were deeply immersed in a ceremony doing their prayers and holy sutras. But the mobile phone of one of the nuns suddenly rang. She took the call and carried the telephone out into the street. The holy ceremony was finished. <laughs> Mount Everest is located partly in Tibet and partly in Nepal. Tibetans call the mountain Mount Chomolongba, the mother goddess of the earth. Over half the world's population lives downstream from Tibet, the source of all of Asia's great rivers. At the onset of winter, the road to the base camp is sometimes shut down due to heavy snows. Traveling this route is not without risk, even in good weather. Where is our guy? At 17,000 feet, the view of the Great Mountain from Everest Base Camp on Tibet's north side is not as familiar as the view from the southeastern side in Nepal. By mid-November, most climbers have packed up and left for the season. The small tea house at the foot of the mountain, home to the world's highest mailbox, is mostly empty. Everest itself is still 12 miles away. Even from the relatively safe location of the base camp, 13,000 feet below the summit, Everest can feel terrifying. High winds and low temperatures force many visitors back a few miles to the relative warmth and comfort of the Rongbuk Monastery. Rongbuk, the highest monastery in the world, was destroyed by the Chinese during the Cultural Revolution. Like many Tibetan monasteries, the facility doubles as a guest house and an occasional party zone for travelers. Early Tibetans were puzzled as to why Europeans wanted to climb Mount Chomolongma Tibetan lamas felt the climbers were not only treading upon sacred ground, but were also disturbing the local mountain god. Maybe they were right. There are hundreds of ways of getting killed on Mount Everest, says climber Peter Athens. To this day, Everest has claimed the life of one climber for every four that have reached the top. <laughs> From a Western perspective, if the mountain's most famous presence was Hillary, as in Sir Edmund Hillary, who along with Sherpa Tenzing Norgay were the first to reach the summit, the spirit of the mountain is haunted by Mallory. George Mallory was a popular British school teacher who survived World War I and enjoyed climbing in the Alps. 
he made several attempts to summit Everest, often accepting a Tibetan blessing at Rongbuk Monastery. There was something Homeric about these men, says Harvard anthropologist Wade Davis about Mallory and his companion Sandy Irvine. They were woefully underdressed, wearing wool vests and flannel shirts, fur-lined motorcycle helmets. Mallory slept in a flimsy tent and read Shakespeare in the snow at 27,000 feet. He knew nothing about the 150 mile an hour winds at the mountain summit. He had never heard of the death zone. Climbing Mount Everest before World War I would have been unimaginable, explains Davis. But after the war, death meant little to these men. It was far more important how they lived. Mallory and companion Sandy Irvine were last seen headed for the mountain summit on June 8, 1924. In 1975, a Chinese mountain climber discovered a body on Mount Everest that he described as old British dead. 24 years later, in May 1999, George Mallory's body was found, along with a few personal items at 27,000 feet. He had disappeared 75 years earlier. His skin was said to be intact and as white as porcelain. Missing was his small pocket camera and with it, any evidence as to whether Mallory reached the summit of Everest 29 years before Hillary and Norgay. The border town of Zhangmu is considered to be little more than a whistle stop on the way to Nepal by most tourists. Occupying a beautiful no man's land between two mountainous countries, Zhangmu's location is stunning. 
Located 13,000 feet below Everest Base Camp, the city curls up into the Tibetan mountainsides like something out of the gods must be crazy. An interesting mix of Chinese owners, Nepali businessmen, and Tibetan workers, the pecking order in Jiangmu pretty much follows in that order. An excellent place for cardiovascular work, Jiangmu's one narrow street is often impassable due to the loading and unloading of parked trucks, which carry goods from all parts of China into neighboring Nepal. The trucks provide employment for many of the city's residents. The one thing you can be sure of, one writer explains, is that the women who do this work are usually stronger than the men. Zhang Mu's cross-cultural ambiance is exciting. Nepali rupees are accepted as readily as Chinese yuan, and businessmen from both countries learn a smattering of each other's languages. In the city's small shops, toiletries, and chocolate bars that one could only dream about in other parts of Tibet make an appearance. The city's restaurants also have an international flavor. The specialty in Wan is called fish resembling eggplant. The Nepali cook at the warm and friendly Sherpa Hotel is a good illustration of the Tibetan pay scale. He works from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. daily. Unhappily, he is paid only $7 a week by the restaurant's Chinese owner. If he were a Tibetan, he would be paid less. Curiously, meals at the Sherpa Hotel are served on an honor basis. Neither the waiters nor the cook can read the English menu. It's therefore up to the restaurant's patrons to explain to the staff how much the meal actually costs. Years ago, the Pali businessmen were forced to travel as far away as Hong Kong or Bangkok to explore business opportunities. But today, a 75-mile journey from Kathmandu to Jiangmu, Tibet, along the mountainous Friendship Highway, has reduced such a need. Jiangmu, Tibet's mini boomtown, is now on the map. And 24 hours a day, it's open for business. Only one-twelfth the size of Tibet, Nepal, Tibet's neighbor to the south, is a much more westernized and commercially developed nation. In Nepal's capital, Kathmandu, each year tens of thousands of international tourists take part in activities ranging from mountaineering to bungee jumping. Some take one-week excursions into Tibet, arranged by local travel agents. The country has been faced with a Maoist insurgency in recent years. Travel advisories have been in effect, and tourism is down. But in Kathmandu's tourist mecca of Tamil, those who ignore the risks find their needs being catered to so thoroughly that most probably feel little need to return home.
four miles outside of Tamil, in a noisy and congested part of town, lies Badnath, the home turf for a Tibetan community numbering in the thousands. Between 40 and 50 Tibetan monasteries can be found in Badnath in a relatively small area. Local community groups have built a support network for Tibetans in exile, which includes medical facilities and even Montessori schools. Exile Tibetans are hardly unique to Nepal. Similar communities can be found in western China, Burma, eastern India, Switzerland, and even New York. The landmark for Tibetans in Nepal is a gigantic chorten or stupa so impressive as to be worthy of the Buddha himself. The sidewalks that surround the structure are a procession of Tibetans, Nepalis, and foreign tourists alike. They are also home to a host of breakfast joints serving coffee and banana pancakes, orange juice, and whole grain cereal. While the village storefronts look like a holdover from King Arthur's court, Badnath, in many ways, can be thought of as a mini Lhasa. Many Tibetans who live in Kathmandu learn Nepali and fall sway to the influences of their host culture. But Tibetan colors, to be sure, are worn like a badge of honor. For Nepal's Tibetans, the preservation of Tibetan culture is paramount. On a normal weekday, a visit to the upper levels of the Chorten has a devotional function as well as a social one. Young people make contributions to the monks at the temple's gate, then climb upward to the top of the temple, their late afternoon conversations bathed in a warm sunlight. A Nepali photographer sits perched high on a rooftop, awaiting a candle lighting ceremony, his camera equipment ready. I've waited two years for this moment, he says with anticipation. Did you see the IMAX film about Everest, he asks? The early part of that film deals with this same ceremony. The proceedings are impressive, symbolizing as they do the Buddha's return to earth. More than 50,000 candles are lit by hand in less than one hour.
I believe uh, that the Tibetan culture will survive uh, mainly uh, because uh, there is strong sense of uh, commitment uh, within the Tibetans in exile, especially the younger generation. For generations, Tibet was seen as a land of magic and mystery, a symbol of the unattainable, the mystical, a world apart. Surely the country has its contrasts. Praised by many for its legendary beauty, portions of Tibet have begun to look more like a cross between a military training zone and the Bonneville salt flats. <laughs> An elderly Tibetan man living in Nepal states, the one thing the Chinese will never touch in my homeland is the mountains. Those mountains are sacred. It would be better that he not return home before he dies, a German woman explains. It would break his heart to see how much mining the Chinese are actually doing in those mountains. Barbara Erickson's quote, about Tibetan culture becoming extinct within 50 years draws interesting responses. Many bristle at the notion that Tibetan culture is dying, but sadly, far too many believe that Erickson has hit the nail right on the head. The culture has no hope of surviving, a longtime visitor states, the two main problems are the Chinese government and money. The monks are not even interested in studying Buddhism anymore, he continues. You can see this with the latest manuscripts they've acquired. The books are just sitting in the monasteries. They haven't even been unpacked. A visitor from Holland voices his own view. The nomadic life in particular, he explains, may eventually become a thing of the past. Worldwide, nomads have been moving closer and closer to cities, often becoming beggars on the outskirts of town. That may happen here, too. For a traveler, Tibet could be a psychological minefield. The uncertainty about travel permits, visa extensions, highway police, city police, bus departures, non-departures, cultural differences, and language barriers all conspire to create an environment that piece by piece takes its toll. Tibet probably never was the earthly paradise people believed it to be. How could any country live up to being the Shangri-La of so many conflicting dreams? Curiously, the country's history of violence has managed to remain a fairly well-kept secret. Tibet was once known as the El Dorado of robbers, and for well over a century, Kampa bandits dominated its mountain passes. In Tibet, the China question will surely occupy center stage for years to come. China has some 100 million migrant workers who travel from province to province seeking employment, explains writer Peter Hessler in his powerful essay, Tibet Through Chinese Eyes. It's a misconception that these people are being sent into Tibet by the Chinese government, says Hessler. The truth is, that the government has little control over the situation. Possibly as many as 80% of the Han Chinese in Tibet are from Sichuan province, where the economic situation is grim. In Sichuan, 120 million people live in an area the size of France. Yeah. Uh. Hessler's profile of a typical Chinese worker in Tibet is that of a person with a sense of adventure and commitment to service. Most tend to be apolitical, send large portions of their salaries back home, and have no intention of staying in Tibet permanently. The majority of Chinese settlers in Tibet, according to Hessler, have failed in business elsewhere and have a single-minded desire to succeed.
Curiously, many Han Chinese in Tibet themselves are troubled by the pattern of Chinese migration. The situation is anything but simple. Yes, the Soviet Union has collapsed and apartheid in South Africa has fallen by the wayside. But Tibet's situation, in many ways, has all the earmarks of a fait accompli. The Norbalinka, the summer palace of the Dalai Lama, is now vacant and overgrown with weeds. It's now the domain only of the occasional visitor or two paying inflated admission fees. The completion of a new railroad from China to Lhasa in a few years will bring thousands of new visitors to Tibet, further sinicizing the country and exposing Tibet to a host of new influences. Only a few may realize it, but the kilometer signs along Tibetan highways don't measure the distances from Lhasa, they measure them from Beijing. For young Tibetans like Pudi, it will continue to be their fate to live in a country divided. Remarkably, the city she lives in, Lhasa, as late as 1979, had been visited by no more than 1,250 Westerners. It's a safe bet that those numbers will be increasing. Upon leaving Tibet, a traveler caught a bus with a gang of affluent Nepalis. As the men drank whiskey and sang loudly, the speed they were traveling at was excessive. <laughs> Somehow, the experience offered yet another perspective on Tibet. Tibet might not be a perfect place, but for the most part, throughout the country, politeness rules. Only rarely does anyone seem to have a chip on his or her shoulder. Seldom is anyone anti-social. There are few Tibetan tank tops or pot bellies. Women don't smoke. In a place like Lhasa, the term juvenile delinquency would probably need to be looked up in a foreign dictionary. Tibet's ancient, rich and unique culture does not only belong to the Tibetans, but it's one of the ancient cultures of this world. Uh, it belongs to the entire world, so it's very important to help preserve this culture. Tibet will forever occupy its niche within the world's imagination. It has caught the attention of Hollywood. It's even inspired films where Buddhist monks have been played by Bolivian Indians. But Tibet must now brace itself for a major collision with the post-industrial landscape. A nation whose people once believed that the rest of the world stopped at the edge of India have been challenged before. But for the merry Tibetans, as writer Heinrich Harrer has so fondly called them, the challenges that lie ahead will be far greater. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.